Welcome into First Draft. It is the start of the best week of the year as the 2024 NFL scum Scouting Combine is upon us. I am Field Yates and the man who is synonymous with not just the NFL Draft, but the NFL Combine because we might not cover it like we do if not for Mel Kuyper Jr. Good morning, my friend. Field, great to be with you. We got a great exercise today with the top 12 picks. We're going to try to combine who we would take and who yep. we think that team will take. So kind of combination of both fields. It's a great exercise pre-combine because a lot of these kids, depending upon what happens in Indy, we either move up or move down. So, and of course, Pro Day is coming up thereafter. But it's a good way to see where kids are right now prior to the combine and how they may change in terms of their rating and their projection once we get out of Indy and move through the process. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how many of the players that we talk about right now, Mel, actually do take part in on-field drills at the combine. As anybody who follows the draft closely knows, players at the very top of the heap oftentimes make a business decision and say, if you don't realize I'm special based off the tape, you're not going to learn that much more about me playing in shorts and a t-shirt on the combine field there in Indianapolis. So you said it, Mel. We're going to go through the first 12 picks. I am general manager of Team Odds. You are general manager of Team Even. So every pick, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, will be yours. I will have 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9, uh, and 11 as well. A reminder, by the way, the first draft available wherever you get your podcasts. We're also on YouTube Mondays and Thursdays. Without further ado, though, Mel, I'm going to put my Ryan Poles cap on as I am the general manager of the Chicago Bears, and I have the first pick in this mock draft, and I will go with, to the surprise of very few people, Caleb Williams, quarterback, USC. And you and I have had this discussion about whether the Bears should be restarting the clock right now or sticking with Justin Fields. We recently both said that we will be trading Justin Fields, recouping whatever value we can get, and leaning towards Caleb Williams, who this past season had maybe a little bit of a down year relative to the season he had two seasons ago. And yet, Mel, still 30-plus passing touchdowns, 10-plus rushing touchdowns, just five interceptions, the most dynamic quarterback inside and out of, outside of the pocket, throwing on the run, an incredible profile and pedigree, a true third-year junior, so he is a younger prospect as well, Mel. To me, Kelly Williams, close to a no-doubt-about-it pick for the Chicago Bears at that number one overall selection. Yeah, Field, I think it gets down to will the Bears be blown away by an offer where they don't have to move down very far, okay, and they can get an elite player like a Marvin Harrison Jr. to pair opposite D.J. Moore, right, if you're going to move forward with Justin Fields. And you get a, a lot of other picks in return if somebody says, hey, we want Caleb Williams. We feel he is the next potentially Patrick Mahomes. We're going to give you the ranch. We're going to give you everything, right? Yeah. If they get blown away by an offer, Will they forget about, hey, resetting the clock and just say, hey, we had a push on these two. It's been tough to make a decision. We like what we've seen of Justin. We like the progress he's made. We think he can get to maybe that level to be in that elite group, but he's not there yet. We think Caleb can be as well, but we're not. We're, we're kind of up in the air on both. We're, we haven't made that decision. Yeah. Well, the decision is going to be made by two things, Field. That's, that's resetting the clock yep. or if you're blown away by an offer. Right. I mean, a monumental offer comes your way with multiple high picks. You can move down and still get Marvin Harrison Jr., right? You're not going to get much in return for Justin Fields. You've gone on record fields. We talked about it on the Darian Mel show Saturday. Second round pick, fourth round pick, that's about it, right? Yep. For Caleb, you're going to get a haul. So if you get that haul, and you don't worry about resetting the clock. And you say, okay, I'm going to take my chance. I think Justin can get to that Lamar Jackson, Josh Allen, okay, Joe Burrow level. Nobody's getting to Mahomes' level. Right. Nobody's yeah. getting to Mahomes' level. Okay? But can you get to where Josh, Lamar, and Burrow are? That's the thing you have to think about. Have we seen enough with Fields? I think he maybe could be. I think we have. Can Caleb certainly be that guy? Based on what we've seen in college, we think he could be. So I think this is a tough decision for Ryan Pauls. I do think how much of an offer he gets for that number one pick overall, to me, Field has to factor into the decision here. No two ways about that, Mel. By the way, I don't want to make it seem like the players that are being taken after Caleb Williams at the quarterback spot are major consolation prizes. You and I have said it a million times. These three quarterbacks at the very top are all outstanding. I think Caleb does rise above the rest in the interest of fairness and balance. A couple of areas that Caleb Williams probably needs to improve upon with the Chicago Bears in this scenario. One, Mel, would be that 
Not every play has to be the swing for the fences opportunity, right? Sometimes it's okay to just take the single, move the sticks a little bit here as a, fo- uh, as a to borrow a football analogy, which I suppose would be appropriate for a football conversation, and just do the easy thing instead of always trying to do the wow thing. And then ball security, 16 fumbles for Caleb Williams during his college career, Mel. Got to hold on to that ball with two hands at all times. Both coachable who, traits. Who do we hear a lot about? Who, who are they saying that about even up till today? Yeah. Josh Allen. Yeah, My guy, Josh. Totally. They, yeah. Yeah, they had critics. Everybody hated him. All those ex-quarterbacks, college and NFL, that were evaluating the quarterbacks in that draft hated Josh Allen. Right. Hated him. Yeah. Okay, now you- they love Josh Allen, right? Yeah. But they still question all those things you said. So even once you've been in the league a while and you had that mat- mentality of being a Superman out there and doing things and you got to kind of balance out taking plays, you can't, you can't make plays without taking chances. No two That's why about. interceptions yeah. sometimes are a little overrated. So, I mean, I know a quarterback threw three picks in the Super Bowl, won MVP not yeah. that long ago. Long for, long for everybody, that was Terry Bradshaw, right? right, back in the late 70s. Not long for me. I was on 18, 19 at the time. Bottom line is field. Caleb Williams could be a grand slam. Justin Fields could be as well. So he's shown the, the ability maybe to get to that point. So I think it's a very, very difficult decision for GM Ryan Poles. Okay, I think it's a difficult decision for GM Mel Kuyper Jr. as the Washington Commanders have picked number two. So who are you taking now with Caleb Williams off the board? Make that attempt to go up to one. Uh, he's a, a local product from Gonzaga High School. I watched him play high school football. Washington would love to get him. You're in the NFC. If you get a Patrick Mahomes type, He's not going to be Mahomes. So if you get a guy who can be in that elite group, then you take a chance and go get him. Now, do you think, how, what's the difference between Caleb and Jaden or Caleb and Drake? You know, based on the way uh, Drake made played towards the end of this year, you'd say it's, you know, it's a little gap there. Drake didn't catch up, even though Caleb had some struggles as well late in the year. For Jaden, he went from a fourth-round pick to maybe the second, third pick overall. But he showed that he could be, as Herm Edwards said, maybe Randall Cunningham, as everybody says, maybe Lamar Jackson, if he's coached up and in the right situation. I'm going to go here, Caleb Williams won. I'm going to go Jaden Daniels. Based on all that momentum and how he played, being that great dual threat, added some weight to that frame, did everything the right way at LSU this year. He balanced out, as you said, Field, taking shots, trying to be Superman. He balanced that out, right? with not turning the ball over, not throwing interceptions, not fumbling the ball away, playing against elite competition, yet frustrating all those defensive coordinators and head coaches in the SEC who could not figure out a way to contain him, let alone stop him. So Jane Daniels, to me, comes in with that positive momentum. He did virtually nothing wrong this year. He had a defense, couldn't stop anybody. He had to put points on the board late. He did that in a lot of games. I'll go for Washington. They're unable to move up to one to get Caleb Williams, and they sit at two, taking Jaden Daniels, quarterback from LSU. Mel, I want to give you a stat here, some stats here, because I was talking to you before the show, but I've had the chance to kind of access some of our uh, stats databases as we are going through our evaluations and seeing whether the film matches up with the stats. How about this? When blitzed in 2023, Jaden Daniels completed 71.1% of his passes. He threw 17 touchdowns, and he had zero picks. So what that was telling you is that, hey, when he's blitzed, if you're trying to bring the house and trying to neutralize Jaden Daniels, it may not work for you. Conversely, when teams dropped into zone coverage, Jaden Daniels this year completed 77.6% of his passes, 2,438 yards with 20 touchdowns and no interceptions, Mel. The bottom line is this, pick your poison when trying to defend Jaden Daniels. You and I have been incredible fans of Jaden Daniels Throughout this process, no surprise that he is one of the top three picks, although I think it is a healthy debate at pick number two, which leads me, Mel, to pick number three. And I'll make this one really simple because there's one quarterback left over for a team that is absolutely desperate for a quarterback. That's the New England Patriots. So zero surprise, Mel. I'm taking Drake May, North Carolina quarterback who just a redshirt sophomore. He's played two full seasons at the collegiate level. I'm not saying that age, guys who are a little bit older, like Jaden Daniels, is a major detriment. I also think that we should acknowledge that Drake May is two full years younger than Jaden Daniels. He just turned 21 years old recently, so the developmental upside is very high. And while it was not a great finish to the season relative to the start of the season, it was a great start to the season for Drake May. Mel, that game against South Carolina, a big game for that state of, uh, well, a big game for both states, I suppose, North and South Carolina. He was excellent. Four touchdowns, zero interceptions against the Miami defense that is going to have a couple of guys drafted from the secondary. 
This player has shown a ton of upside, and he is a strike thrower, Mel. I know that we have been talking a lot about Jaden Daniels, but you and I both agree that Jarek Drake May still has all the goods to be a high, high-level franchise-type quarterback in the NFL. Yeah, you know, you just hope, feel that they will build that offensive line up, get some receivers they did not. They got Mac Jones out to dry. They didn't give Mac Jones a fighting chance. And if you go Drake Mayer, you got to develop and build that offensive line. You got to get some weapons around him. So hopefully they handle a situation in terms of the talent around Drake May a lot better than they did with one Mac Jones. So again, you're in the AFC. You're in a division with Josh. You're certainly talking about the greatness of Josh Allen. We're talking about what Tua can do. And Aaron Rodgers is coming back for a couple more years, right? And you're in the AFC loaded with players like the elite Patrick. Mahomes, yep. who's one of the greatest of all time. You gotta, you gotta hope that Drake May can be that guy. And the only way he will be field is for the organization to do what they need to do, which is what everybody needs to do. Help your quarterback out. Don't forget about him. Remember when Houston forgot about David Carr? How'd that work out, yeah, right? Well, yeah. You know, they forgot about Mac Jones. Yeah, I mean, Drake May's a lot more talented than Mac, but every quarterback needs some assistance up front, unless you're Mahomes who can win with anybody. So, uh, uh, you know, Drake May, no question, at three. Uh, if it goes the way we, scope, we, we have figured it out, one and two, Drake May at three. There's no other way for the Patriots to go. Yeah, two important parts of that conversation, Mel. We recently got the salary cap number for the 2024 league year. It's huge. It rose by nearly $30 million. The Patriots were already equipped with a lot of space. They've got a whole bunch more. Is there going to be, once we have uh, the finalized credits from last year, which I know that's very inside baseball stuff there talking salary cap mail, but the Patriots have a ton of resources to spend and wide receiver and left tackle in free agency. Additionally, that top of the second round pick could be a spot for the Patriots to land a supporting cast to help Drake May because you are correct, no matter how great you are, nobody can do it without a whole bunch of help. Three picks, three quarterbacks. Coming up next here on First Ref, we continue with our mini mock draft, the top 12 picks with a quarterback finally caught the board. Find out next. All right, back here on First Draft, he is Mel Kuyper Jr. I am Field Yates, and we are going back and forth. Picks 1 through 12. Mel has the evens. I have the odds. He was very gentlemanly, magnanimous to give me the odd selections. I think things are a little bit easier. But, Mel, you are now on the board. Three quarterbacks taken. You are the Arizona Cardinals, who, by the way, about an hour before our show began, decided to put on Twitter, which I know, Mel, you love the Twitter, uh, the Cardinals. Their franchise quarterback, and it was just a big picture of Kyler Murray. So they're out of the quarterback business. Which way do they go instead? Well, you got to help Kyler Murray out, and uh, this is an easy one. I don't even have to go to my sheet jet field and my ratings board because it's Marvin Harrison Jr. And if you think about Marvin Harrison Jr., yes, he had a couple drops, right? You get a, the, the ability to make all the contested catches. His father was a great player with that great work ethic, great passion for the game. Marvin Harrison Jr. has exactly that as well with more imposing size than his dad had coming out of Syracuse back in the day. So for Marvin Harrison Jr., you have another pick in the late first round field. The offensive line is a critical need area for the Arizona Cardinals. We're talking about Drake May goes to New England. The O-line receivers need to be picked up to be a pick up the pace there, improve the talent base, right? Well, the bottom line is Arizona, the O-line, get a receiver like Marvin Harrison Jr., then come back, whether it's Graham Barton, the all-around swing man type out of Duke can play anywhere, uh, an interior guy probably, guard center, or a guy like a Marius Mims or a Taylor Guyton, Mims from Georgia, Guyton from Oklahoma. Uh, there's going to be offensive linemen, both interior and offensive tackle-wise, that will be in the mix for Arizona in the late first round, but get the great receiver who is a nightmare to match up against with these smaller corners that don't have the length, the physicality, the catch radius of Marvin Harrison Jr. Mel, I don't really have much of an argument or much of a debate with Marvin Harrison Jr. going forth given the Cardinals' needs and also the level of prospect that he is. There's only one thing that I want to say, and I don't know if this sounds outrageous, Mel, because I don't think it is outrageous, and I think the people in the NFL might see it similarly. Marvin Harrison Jr., is an outstanding prospect and the number one wide receiver on my board. That gap between him and Malik Neighbors from LSU, though, Mel, doesn't feel that dramatic to me. I just can't wait to see if Malik Neighbors does run the 40 this week in Indianapolis, how fast he runs and how that might change the narrative, even if just a little bit surrounding Malik Neighbors, who's just so incredibly explosive. But Marvin Harrison Jr., a hard guy to pick against in this exercise. Now things get interesting, though. I feel like it's my first difficult pick. At number five, overall, I'm the Los Angeles I'm my Chargers. I'm getting my sheets You got now. your sheets ready, Mel? I'm ready now. The sheets are ready. Yep. Charger on the clock here, yep. pick five. 
As of this mock draft, they still have Mike Williams. They still have Keenan Allen on the roster. March actions lead to April reactions. So for all those factors, I'm going with Joe Alt, offensive tackle, Notre Dame. This is where I had him in my mock draft 1.0. And Mel, you and I have talked about not just what the player brings to the table, but also the fundamental decision. As far as what the player brings to the table, you are talking about a six foot eight, 322 pound dancing bear who is so incredibly composed, rarely gets beat off the snap, Mel. He can move some bodies around in the running game. This is a player who's got some excellent bloodlines. His father was a first round pick for the Chiefs. Out of Iowa some 30 years ago, this kid was born to play in the NFL, Mel. And I believe, when listening to the com- to the comments from Jim Harbaugh, their new head coach, Joe Hortiz, their new general manager, of course, came from the Baltimore Ravens, and Greg Roman, their new offensive coordinator, all three of them have waxed poetic about the importance of being physical and running the football. That leads me to believe that they would choose Joe Alt over a wide receiver like Malik Neighbors just because of the position that he plays. Your thoughts. Yeah, I think Joe moving the right tackle. I think that's something where you say, do you take the left tackle, move him the right tackle? Do you take the right tackle, the pure right tackle? We have a couple in this draft. Is it too high for J.C. Latham from Alabama? A Fuaga from Oregon State's a really good player, but Latham is getting a lot of positive momentum and positive commentary right now as well coming out of Alabama. For Joe Walt, watch him every week. Certainly a guy who kept that frame between the defensive end and the quarterback maintained a high level of efficiency week in and week out, play in and play out. He was getting the job done at a high level. I think certainly his father played in the NFL, John All coming out of Iowa with the Kansas City Chiefs. Joe Watt's going to go a lot higher in the draft than his dad did. Uh, I'm with you. I think the offensive line area with Justin Herbert and you think about getting receiver. This is the deepest position in this draft is wide receiver mm. field. We can find in the fifth, sixth round, receivers going to help teams as third, fourth options. Maybe even a little bit better than that. So you can go 25 wide receivers deep with really good players in this draft. I think they'll get one or two and take advantage of that at some point. Taking Not taking neighbors or Odunze, it's hard to pass up and over and overlook those guys, but certainly the offensive line is that critical need area. Brock Bowers would have to be in the discussion as well, but I have no issue at all with them taking Joe Walt at this point. Look at that. We're kind of agreeing on things so far. And by the way, people, we're talking about blue chip prospects. I have a list of players that I believe fit into that blue chip category, however you want to call it, however you want to label it, guys who are first round, top 10 locks, basically independent of what draft year we are in. Joe Alt, part of that group, as are the four players that went ahead of Joe Alt. So let's get to pick number six here, Mel, because I do think there is a follow-up conversation that I want to have because I don't think you're going to take the player that I have a question about. Who would you take if you were Joe Shane, the Giants general manager, with pick six overall? Yeah, I'm a Daniel Jones fan, and I think you get a a big-time receiver. You're getting a guy who certainly could be – you can make a strong argument. You know, he could go even a little higher than this, you know, with the Chargers being a possibility there. You mentioned Marvin Harrison Jr., and you think Malik Neighbors is right there. I happen to think Romo Dunze is very close. I'm a big Romo Dunze fan coming out of Washington. So you're really splitting hairs, Neighbors, Odunze. They got a choice. Whoever they like the most of those two has to be a New York Giant. I get it. There's an offensive line issue there as well. But the wide receiver position for Daniel Jones to get a guy like Odunze to me, and that's where I would go. That's my my pick here is Odunze for the New York Giants. He has the size. He has the ability with that catch radius to outdo cornerbacks for the football. He's so smooth. He's so, I think, deceptive with how he runs his routes. He's very difficult to handle in those situations. You go to the national championship game, he was open. Michael Penix Jr. wasn't able to get in the ball. Look at the consistency in terms of week in and week out. Five or more catches in every game. Only game he did was three against Utah, and he had a couple touchdown receptions in this game. Nobody found a way to contain him. And people say, well, he had other great receivers. Well, Jalen McMillan wasn't healthy all year. Polk had a good year. Jalen Polk did, but he didn't have McMillan healthy the whole season. Romo Dunze, everybody knew he was the number one guy. He was the guy we had to figure out a way to contain, and they could not do it. He is going to be a freakish talent when he starts testing, whenever he does it, combine pro day. Uh, you know, he can jump out of the building, and he has that size. He's, what, 215, 218 in that area. Uh, I'm a huge Romo Dunze fan. I give him the slight edge over Malik Neighbors, and it's really 
too close to call. I know your neighbor's guy feel, but I'm going Romo Dunze, wide receiver Washington to the New York Giants. Yeah, I've got neighbors wide receiver two, been consistent with that, as you have with Romo Dunze being wide receiver two. I think all three of these guys, Miller, borderline can't miss at the wide receiver spot, which is why I'm not trying to be disrespectful of the excellence, the brilliance of Marvin Harrison Jr. I just want people to know that I do think the gap between he and those next two wide receivers, most specifically Malik Neighbors, is not so astronomical that Neighbors should be viewed as kind of like the other guy in this wide receiver dynamic. We have just a couple of minutes left here, Mel, before we get on to the next pick. I want to ask you something, and I want you to tell me whether you, you, Mel Kuyper Jr., not the person who might be making this pick, think it's preposterous. The Giants may need a quarterback upgrade because while Daniel Jones, you're a fan of him, I think there are others who have questions about him. You're not going to get J.J. McCarthy if you wait until the second round. Would you ever consider pulling, making J.J. McCarthy the sixth overall pick in the 2024 NFL Draft, or is that completely blasphemous? Preposterous is the word I think you said. <laughs> yep, I, I can't go there. I, I think, they, I, I, and I'll give you a couple. Of, first of all, I think it's too rich, way too rich for me for JJ McCarthy in the top six. Okay, uh, yeah. If you're picking six, you got to get a quarterback you believe is right there with Drake May. Yeah. If you're picking this high, and JJ has a chance, and I'm, I will get to JJ down the line a little bit here. He's a tough one for me. I'm at 23 on my big board, but I think when you look at mock drafts and projecting where he'll go, I do think he's definitely going to be QB four. I will say this: Daniel Jones to me is and will be when we look back to the careers of Daniel Jones and JJ McCarthy. Daniel Jones is going to be a better quarterback. Daniel Jones has already shown mm. he can be a winning NFL quarterback, a really good quarterback. He needs help. We talked about what New England didn't do with their guy. The Giants get more help, stay healthier, okay? Get guys healthy, get it together, maintain some consistency, and Daniel Jones is the right man for the job. You know, at the end of part of the interruption when Tony Kornheiser waves the Canadian flag, that might be me waving the white flag here on Daniel Jones' mail. I'm nervous. I'm nervous. The turnover is just far too prolific during his time. And now he's got an ACL tear on top of two neck injuries. I wouldn't take a quarterback at sixth overall as well. But I understand that GMs and coaches are under pressure. So I'm just saying, uh, crazier thoughts have entered my mind than the Giants reaching for a quarterback early in round one. We are coming back with pick seven through nine. More on first draft in just a moment. All right, we are back here on First Draft. He is Mel Kuyper Jr. I am Field Yates, and the exercise is straightforward. The first 12 picks of the 2024 NFL Draft. Mel is the evens. I am the odds, which means that I am back on the clock with the Tennessee Titans. And I, I feel a little bit um, uneasy, Mel, because there are parts of me that feels like some of the first 10 picks of the NFL Draft should be straightforward if the team follows what we believe is right, more so than the average top 10. This is one of those picks where it feels like this one should be sprinting the card right to Commissioner Goodell. Tennessee Titans take Malik Neighbors, number seven overall wide receiver out of LSU. This guy had 27 forced missed tackles last season, Mel, and he's the most explosive player in the entire NFL draft. He's the closest that I can think of from a wide receiver to Tyree Kill. Nobody is as explosive as Tyree Kill, but when you watch him, you see traces, you see you see sign. You see brief moments where you say to yourself, that guy runs away from defensive players, a la Tyree Kill. He does not need some long running head start. He gets the football, and he is off to the races. 14 touchdown catches this past season for Malik Neighbors. A big boost after just three the year prior. I think there's a case for him as a clear-cut top five player in the NFL draft mail for the Titans who need wide receivers in a major way to continue to help Will Levis. Along with some offensive line reinforcements, I think Malik Neighbors would be a terrific home run pick here for Rand Carth on their GM at pick seven. What do you think? Yeah, a couple things here, Field. I think they hit, they really hit with, with uh, Will Levis. I mean, getting him in a second round, you talk about saving money on your quarterback and how it helps you, you know, address other positions. And, and Will Levis showed, showed this year uh, when, of course, first of all, he got hurt, that he has everything it takes. From an arm strength standpoint, we knew he had that. Mobility, the want to, the toughness, the desire, the smarts, he has it all. So for Brian Callahan, I think you got the right quarterback here. The O-line was awful. 
awful. Yeah. I mean, I watched this team on a regular basis. They could not protect Will Levis. Ryan Tannehill didn't matter. Will Levis was getting beaten up every game. It's amazing he got to where he did before he went down. He tried to even play through that injury. It was the same thing at Kentucky. Will can't get any, any luck on the, on the offensive line front. He had a terrible offensive line his final year at Kentucky and a terrible offensive line his first year with the Tennessee Titans. So they have to address that position. They have to get a lot better up front. Skaronsky last year can be a really good guard, but they got to get help outside and they could not block anybody. It was Ole block after Ole block. I'm with you at this point on Neighbors. Neighbors will be that dynamic weapon for Will Levis. Traylon Burks has not emerged. Remember, A.J. Brown's dealt. They draft Traylon Burks out of Arkansas. He has not emerged yet as any type of big-time weapon. Okay? D-Hop, DeAndre Hopkins, still a good player, right? But they need a guy like Neighbors, no question. But the O-line has to be a major point of emphasis, both in free agency and in the draft. Obviously, if Joe Alt were there, they would jump at that opportunity. We have him off the board. You got him going a little earlier. Uh, I, I'm with you on the wide receiver, but they got to get that offensive line better. Yeah, no question about it, Mel. And I think they're going to probably end up cutting Andre Dillard at some point early in free agency. Their swing last year from Philadelphia, signing the three-year deal, I imagine he is not long for Tennessee, which means they're going to need a new left tackle at some point, perhaps at the top of round two. Let's get to pick number eight, Mel, and I think things get very interesting here as still no defensive players taken. We've had three quarterbacks. We've had three wide receivers plus a big offensive tackle. You're now the Atlanta Falcons who have gone back to back to back years with the eighth pick previously used on Drake London and then last year on Bijan Robinson. How about now? Who are you taking under new head coach Raheem Morris? This is a tricky one because this team has no quarterback right yeah. now. A quarterback that you can win with moving forward, right? And then it's always tempting. To, you know, like I said, you're going to reach for J.J. McCarthy. I'm not if I'm the Giants. I'm not if I'm Atlanta. And I think last year they should have drafted Will Levis. If they had Will Levis, wouldn't have been having this discussion about quarterbacks right now. They would have had their guy. You can find the running backs in the draft every year. But they went with Bijan, who's a heck of a player. But they still have this huge quarterback issue. Okay, you're in a division where you put Will Levis on his team and you build around him. They got something there, but Will's in Tennessee. Now you think about the defense. You don't take the quarterback here. You either try to move up. If you can move up and get Caleb or Jaden or Drake, I would be aggressive for Wyatt Lynn and try to do that. If you're sitting at eight and you cannot move up, I'm not taking J.J. McCarthy at eight. It's too high for me. I got to improve the defense. Need the pass rusher. Who's the best defensive player in this draft? Terry and Arnold runs good 40 combine pro day. Terry and Arnold, cornerback Alabama, will be in this discussion in that top 10 to 15, no doubt about that. But Dallas Turner had the kind of year field that he needed to. Will Anderson Jr. moves on. Who's going to be the guy? He, can he be that guy? And he was. He had done it early on. Then he had this, uh, the year prior to that, 2022, where he wasn't as good. Opposite Anderson getting after the quarterback. This year, he took his game to a new level, both being consistent week in and week out, being a guy who got after the quarterback, both in terms of beating that tackle out of the blocks and being relentless in terms of getting after that quarterback and getting coverage sacks. He was a guy who was getting his hands on that quarterback, okay? He was affecting the quarterback. The quarterback felt Dallas Turner in that area getting after him. So for the Atlanta Falcons, Dallas Turner, pass rusher, outside backer out of Alabama, becomes the eighth pick overall, and I think he is the best defensive player in this draft. How about Malachi Watson, Mel? I, I, I don't want to just sit here and tell you the entire time I agree, great assessment, because, you know, I think everything you said, I, I understand. Is Leatu Latu not a better player right now than Dallas Turner? What breaks the tie for you between those two edge rushers? I think it's the question with the neck of the medical. Uh, Latu had a heck of a year. Latu is a natural pass rusher, uh, I think. But the medical, yeah, if that comes out clean, I'm with you. Latu, you could argue, is right there with Dallas Turner, maybe even a little ahead. But Dallas Turner had a heck of a year. Don't take anything away from Turner and the kind of player he is. Yep. He had one whale of a season. He had done it early on in his career as well. He had put up good numbers. But certainly for Latu, I agree. I think he is a really good player. He's going to go somewhere between the middle portion of the first round and and the later portion of round one, depending upon what your medical staff feels. How do they feel about lot two after everything's been done at the combine? You do all your due diligence there. Remember, Jalen Phillips had an injury question coming out of Miami. He went around at 18 spot. So I think top 10 is a little high because of that question mark. That's why Dallas Turner gets the edge here. All right, well, top 10 might be a little bit too high in your eyes, Mel, but it's not in mine, baby. Is with pick number nine in our little mini mock draft here. 
Me, once again, acting as Ryan Poles, is going to take Leatu Latu, the edge, the pass rusher from UCLA, and had an incredible season, really an incredible two-year run at UCLA. Keep in mind this very important part of the equation. The Chicago Bears, even after acquiring Montez Sweat, who was awesome with six and a half sacks, still were second in the NFL in terms of fewest sacks. So I guess 31st is the proper way of putting it. I think Leatu Latu is just born to rush the passer. Coming out of college, I find that there are two things that we see most often with pass rushers. Usually it's the guys who are just too fast to be blocked, or it's the guys that are just too big to be blocked. Neither of those things applies to Leatu Latu. He's 6'5", 265 pounds. He's not going to blow you away with his overall stature, Mel. And he is not this freak athlete, like Dallas Turner might well prove he is during his week in Indianapolis. But Leatu Latu... It's just so nuanced in his pass rushing ability. He knows how to get around opposing tackles. I am convinced that there is one way and one way only the teams in the Pac-12 were able to have a successful day against Leatu Latu, and that was to throw three bodies at him. And the net result of that, Mel, was the Murphy Twins, who are also draft prospects in this year's class, ended up having a bunch of run-free sacks. That's the kind of impact that Leatu Latu had on this UCLA defense this past year. I think he is a ready-made starter for the Chicago, Bra- uh, Chicago Bears. I understand the medical side of it. I'm not a doctor. Maybe we'll find out more during this week in Indianapolis. But for now, assuming he, cl- he checks out cleanly, I still think he's the best prospect, excluding health, in this entire class. On defense. Disagree with your field. Ninth pick, you got to get a guy inside your top nine. I, I can't see Latu being rated on any on a board in that six, seven, eight range. Who do I see that high? Brock Bowers. Mm. We haven't talked Brock Bowers enough yet. Brock Bowers, you say, well, Cole Komet, right? We have, you know, whether it's Justin Fields or Caleb Williams. I don't care what you decide to do there. Fields, Williams, Brock Bowers is not a tight end. He's a move him around weapon. Okay, he can do anything you want. You can line him up anywhere you want on the football field. All this kid's going to do is make big play after big play. He's fast. He has a sixth sense about things on the football field that all the great ones have. He is a guy that defenses could not even figure out a way to contain. Everything went through him. It's that offense at Georgia. Uh, Certainly, Ladd McConkey, a heck of a player as well. But Brock Bowers, because he can do everything. He is a receiving weapon nightmare for defenses to try to handle. If I'm the Bears and I'm sitting there at nine and he's on the board, I'm, I'm doing I'm like, Caleb Williams or Justin Fields are jumping up and down saying, yes, yes, yeah. I got a big-time weapon for my offense to help me out. Well, you just took my pick, so we'll find out whether Brock Bowers and one of Mel's picks coming up next year on First Draft, selections 10 through 12. All right, we're back here on First Draft, and we're going to wrap up our top 12 picks. Mel is the GM of the even teams. I am the GM of the odd teams. The New York Jets are on the clock here, Mel. You have the even picks. You have the Jets, and this is an interesting one because more so than any team that we have discussed so far, this team not just wants to but needs to win this year with Aaron Rodgers going into his age 40 season. What is GM Joe Douglas going to do? Well, he's got the options. He's got some great options here right now, Field, because the offensive line is a big issue. Aaron Rodgers is coming back, hopefully going to give them two great years, right? This is You're swinging for the fences with Aaron. You, a Super Bowl, that's what you want, right? <coughs> Aaron Rodgers has been the one he wanted. He's been the one Super Bowl. That's what you want. you got to protect them. Coming back to the injury, 40 years of age, come on. you got to get the O-line, but there's Brock Bowers according to this. You didn't take him, Field. That's right. It's all yours, Evan. Not taking Brock Bowers at nine, right? So here's Brock Bowers sitting there at 10. I would look at Brock Bowers. That would be my guy. I'm taking – within seconds, I'm getting that card in to take Brock Bowers. But do they look at an offensive line, a natural right tackle, like maybe J.C. Latham from Alabama, who's still there. His stock is rising, right? Mentioned Fuaga from Oregon State, right tackle. Stock has been rising all year. So the O-line is going to be in the mix. I'm big Brock Bowers guy. That's got to be, for me – It's Brock Bowers. Okay, Brock Bowers. I disagree. I think the Jets, just with their current situation, absolutely, unequivocally, must find a player that can protect Aaron Rodgers. Right tackle, left tackle, doesn't matter to me, but it's got to be a guy who can step in and protect Aaron Rodgers and do so right away, by the way, Mel, which is why. Well, if I were the one making the pick, and I'm not, of course, I think there is a strong case for Tyler Guyton as having the second most upside of any offensive tackle 
in this year's entire class. But Talisi Fuaga, you mentioned him from Oregon State, might just be that much more ready-made, where if your clock needs yeah. to start right now, I get the Fuaga tiebreaker. I don't want to argue Brock Bowers. I still love the kid. I feel bad for him. I've already written a multiple personal apology notes because he didn't go high enough in my mock draft 1.0. I just think the Jets need to consider allocating resources to more important, pivotal spots on their roster. They can do fine with Tyler Conklin continuing to be their starting tight end in 2024. This yeah, doing is fine. It's not good one. enough, Phil. Doing fine. That's right. Well, no, no, doing fine there, but being a whole lot better at right tackle. Now, that's the trade that I'm and, willing to make. And I'll say this. But, okay. But but Guyton needs to be coached up. Guyton's a right. work in progress. They need somebody ready to play immediately. And I think that would be more J.C. Latham from Alabama. Yeah, that's why. Listen, I'm saying if if I could make the pick and I had the opportunity to wait, Tyler Guyton, who's basically got one full year playing as a starter at the college level, I think the upside is so tantalizing and tremendous. I get it. Not every team, especially the Jets, can afford to wait. So now things get interesting. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Minnesota Vikings on the clock here. Pick number 11. Quarterback question, of course. If Kirk Cousins returns, then that's not a quarterback question. But if he walks, then all of a sudden this is a very interesting quarterback team. But I'm going to continue to operate on the presumption, Mel, the Kirk Cousins will be back this upcoming year in Minnesota. So that brings me to Jared Verse. Florida State, pass rusher, Minnesota Vikings, pick number 11 overall. <clears throat> Jared Verse had yet another strong season for the Seminoles. was probably maybe a touch better the year prior, but came out in the first week against LSU, went gangbusters there, had an incredible finish to the season in the ACC championship game. Long, powerful, Versatile. This is a guy who's come a long way, Mel, from being a red shirt. He red shirted as a tight end at Albany five seasons ago. A player that a lot of us thought could have come out last year, instead returned for one more season with the Seminoles, a defense that was absolutely dominant and could have half a dozen guys drafted from this past year's roster. Nine sacks this past season, Mel. Don't know that the upside athletically is quite at the same level as somebody like Dallas Turner, but I do think he gives the Vikings, who have both Daniil Hunter and DJ Wanham scheduled to become free agents, both very talented pass rushers. Of course, Hunter, one of the best in all of football. This would be some insurance against one or both of those guys departing in free agency. Thoughts on Jared Verse? Jared's a tough one. I think there's mixed opinion for a reason. I think he is that powerful defensive end, pass rusher, no question about it. Uh, but I think when you look at where he will be in the NFL against these elite, best in the world offensive tackles, can he be able to handle that? Can he be able to get that double? You're looking for double digit sacks. Can he get to that point in the National Football League? The potential's there. You speak to people in the league, there is mixed opinion on Jared Verse. Some say lock first round. Some say we're later first round. I think he does go in the middle of the first round field. I do think he has to be in the discussion here for the Minnesota Vikings. You mentioned Hunter, right? He could be moving on. You think about where we are in the NFL with pass rushers. That's what you have to have. But you also have to have cover guys. There's a corner named Terry and Arnold out of Alabama who is a heck of a player. And if he runs well, we talk about Keon Coleman, wide receiver, Florida State needs to run well. So does cornerback Terry and Arnold. If he does, based on his performance this past year, intercepting passes, breaking up passes, getting his hands on everything, tackling, fourth leading tackler field. This kid's aggressive, he's versatile, he's vocal, he's energetic, coached by Nick Saban. NFL loves Nick Saban guys for yeah. good reason. Uh, to me, Terry and Arnold, where is your grade on Arnold as opposed to Verse in terms of the board? I think that, because they're both needs. Verse and Arnold, how they stack up on the board, I think determines what this pick ends up being. Yeah, and my board, Mel, it actually isn't that close. I jammed a need here. That's what I did. I jammed the need for the Minnesota Vikings to pick number 11 because Terry and Arnold is like six or seven spots higher than Jared Verse in my overall top 25 board, which will soon expand to top 50, by the way, to get more guys who are not going to go in the first round to be included in the conversation. I went back and forth on this for a very specific reason. What Brian Flores was able to do last year, scheming his way to a much improved defense and devaluing certain spots or extracting the maximum out of certain spots was nothing short of remarkable. I think he was a worthy 
candidate to be in the discussion for the best defensive coach or best assistant coach and all of the NFL this past season, a guy, Byron Murphy, the other Byron Murphy, the guy that uh, was drafted a handful of years ago, now plays for the Minnesota Vikings, was a solid free agent addition. And they kind of just found a way at that cornerback spot, perhaps better than I would have expected them to based off of how I would just rate the raw talent there. Terry Donald, very tantalizing. Good call right there. You've already made me rethink my pick. But I want to leave time for pick number 12, Mel, because this is where I think things get spicy. The Denver Broncos, 12th overall pick. I have a sense of what you're going to do. What will your decision be? My decision, after all is said and done, in terms of the mock, is I think we got to tell people who we think. If, they, if it goes the way we're saying, Field, and you brought his name up as consideration early, now though it's too early, and I still think this is too early for me, I would move down, but then the worry is somebody's going to get him. He's a quarterback. I love his competitiveness. He just turned 21. Uh, he did everything Jim Harbaugh asked him to do. It's J.J. McCarthy. I'm with you. I'm not going to go any different direction here. Denver is in a division with the great one. He's in a conference with a lot of really good ones, the great ones, right? You got to get the quarterback here. And J.J. McCarthy and feel like Peyton, you had you know, Drew Brees, right, out of the Big Ten. J.J. McCarthy out of the Big Ten. J.J. brings that desire to be great, that competitiveness, that ability to run, beat you with his legs, extend plays. Uh, he threw the football, I thought, in a lot of games very well. Some receivers let him down. He did not have anything close to a Marvin Harris. Jr. No go-to. Roman Wilson's a nice player. What's he, a third, fourth round pick? Maybe third round pick? He didn't have that elite wide receiver. They were a run-oriented team with the offensive line, but J.J. did what he needed to do. And when he needed to make plays, he did. He didn't throw interceptions, but he threw a couple key ones that we remember, but not many interceptions during his career. He's very young. I'll go here. I'll stretch it at this point at 12 with the Denver Broncos taking quarterback J.J. McCarthy from Michigan. Yeah, and there's a, there's a draft capital problem for Denver too, by the way. Right, Mel? They've got six total picks. No second-round pick. Where are you getting a quarterback if it's not at pick 12? History tells you betting on it in the third round is usually a long-shot bet. J.J. will continue to be the most difficult evaluation in the entire draft. You talked about him on last week's show in that very same context. There is certainly a lot to like, Mel. The question is this, we have seen a larger sample size of other top prospects in this class playing under duress, playing in gotta have it situations, playing from behind in the fourth quarter. Things that are gonna happen to a young quarterback who's being taken in the top 12 because these are not exactly the top of the food chain teams. JJ McCarthy is a very good athlete. His ball placement is terrific. Leadership by all accounts is excellent. There's a lot to like about what J.J. McCarthy brings to the table, but I don't know how many times we can say it without us sounding repetitive and redundant. He is a tricky evaluation because the sample size and some of those critical factors is just so small, Mel. It is just so small. It's a roll of the dice, but if you're Sean Payton, I don't know that you have any other choice there, Mel, because if you don't take him now, you're not getting him later, and I don't think there's any quarterback in the third round that I would feel comfortable saying he's the guy going into week one. Yeah, I think Bo Nix, I think Senior Bowl week didn't help Bo Nix. The injuries, the four injuries of Michael Penix Jr. and the struggles in the national championship game, I think are the reasons why the QB4 is going to be J.J. McCarthy. Yeah. And I think the interviews, I think certainly you're talking about pro days and what have you there. I think when he tests athletically, but certainly the interviews are going to be very important. We know what Jim Harbaugh said. Hey, I'll take guy number one. You know, Jim Harbaugh's not going to obviously think that Justin Herbert, but it was just, Jim Harbaugh loves this kid. And I think the competitiveness, I think the, the, the aggressive qualities of this kid, the Josh Allen type. Hey, I, I'll do anything it takes. I'll go through that wall to help our team. He has that field. Yeah. And I think he's young. Like I say, just turned 21 years of age in February. There's a lot to like about J.J. McCarthy. It is a little rich for me at 12. I'm 23 on the board. Yeah. But hey, he's a quarterback. He's QB4. You need him. You got to get him. Uh, more thoughts to close things out here on First Draft in just a minute with Mel on field. All right, we're back here on First Draft to wrap up and close out our thoughts on the top 12 mini mock draft that we just conducted. Mel as Team Evens, me as Team Odds. I'll rip through these picks really quickly here. Mel, uh, Bears, Caleb Williams, Commanders, Jaden Daniels, Patriots, Drake, May, Cardinals, Marvin Harrison Jr., Chargers, Joe Alt, Giants, Roman Dunze, Titans, Malik Neighbors, Falcons, Dallas Turner, Bears, Layatu Latu, Jets, Brock Bowers, 
Vikings, Jared Verse, and the Denver Broncos, J.J. McCarthy. What do you think was the hardest pick for you to make amongst those six that you had to do? The hardest pick for me is Brock Bowers. Uh, and, and it's because you say, well, we have other guys, but he's not just a tight end field. You got to expand it. You got to say he can do everything. We can line him up anywhere and we can create mismatches and we can, he can be our quarterback's best friend. And we will, you know, defensive coordinators are going to have to figure out how to not don't, don't know where he's going to line up let alone try to contain them. So for me, you can say, well, they have another guy at that spot. They're okay at that spot. Okay and being fine and decent isn't Brock Bowers. So you got to go, and you can't say, well, we have a tight end. Well, you don't have Brock Bowers, mm -hmm. but you can move all over the place. Yeah. So this guy is special field in my mind, and when you have a special entity like that, I can't see him getting into that. Some people have him in that 15 to 17, 18 range. Uh, if he gets down that far, and we've seen it before, great players are dropped field. Sure, they do, yeah. right? The great tight ends in the NFL, the great weapons at that position in the NFL didn't go very high, right? Kelsey, Kittle, Andrews, and the like didn't go that high. Gronk went second round when he came out. So the great tight ends did not go high. So maybe he does drop a bit. If he does, he's a super steal. It does feel like, by the way, Mel, every year there's kind of one guy who the NFL maybe overthinks mm -hmm. just the touch. Uh, he only played four games last season, but Christian Gonzalez was a popular top 10 player in the draft or top 10 mock drafted player who ends up going 17th. And it looked like that was perhaps the hit of all hits for the Patriots in their recent draft history. I'll offer up my most difficult pick, and it was the one that by the end of the show I was already wanting to change. And that was Jared Verse going 11th overall. Mel Kuyper Jr. is a persuasive man in America. He's been doing this for 46 drafts, and he has taught me in about 46 seconds that Terry and Arnold was a better pick than Jared Verse. But it's always fun to see how this exercise unfolds. Uh, the evens versus the odds. We could do this probably for the entirety of the first round, but we will stop it there. A reminder, first draft is back on Thursday. Mel, the Combine is here. Last 30 seconds of the show. How excited are you for this week ahead? Can't wait to see it. I think there are several players that we're looking forward to seeing what their measurables are going to be, how fast they're going to be. I have Mach 2.0 coming out Wednesday, Field, so I'm going to be working hard getting that all together over the next day. Or Mach 2.0 discussion on Thursday's show. For Mel, on Field, we'll talk to you guys again on the next edition of First Draft.